He then pursued fellowship in pediatric infectious diseases at the University of Colorado Children's Hospital. Um, here at UW, he is focused on training health professionals both locally and globally um, with, a, with an emphasis on immunization programs. He has, his longstanding work in these areas have been recognized nationally by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, he will be talking to us today on immunization in pregnancy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Conway. Thanks. Uh-oh, we're going off script here. Going off script. Just a quick word. So sometimes, you know, at the University of Wisconsin, it's hard to figure out who's really famous in the world and who isn't. I'm just saying, Conway is really famous. He's done a lot of work. Famous meaning a lot of national, international recognition. Has done a lot of work with Nicholas on HPV vaccination. So again, we're so happy you're here. Sorry we're a little late. No worries. Thanks, Laura. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, outside of my comfort zone a little bit, talking to you folks. And I would just want to sort of share a disclaimer that anything I say, I never want to um, make any disparaging sense that, uh, that under immunization in the populations that you guys serve um, is by any means anything that any of us criticize. As a matter of fact, I think most of us are pretty amazed that you're able to achieve the immunization rates that you are. Uh, and I think what we really want to talk about is sort of what some of the things are that are benefits and what are the, some of the arguments you may be able to make to try to push people um, to immunize a little bit more broadly and then give you a little bit of sense for what may be coming down the pike because this area of immunizing during pregnancy is a really hot topic. And so there's a lot of work being done in trying to figure out better ways to actually provide both early neonatal coverage against infectious diseases, but also actually better ways to protect pregnant women themselves. And so this whole space of really working on immunizing in this very vulnerable population is really pretty exciting, but obviously is fraught with a lot of um, uh, stress for a lot of people. Um, I work with basically anybody that cares about vaccines, whether they're from a public policy side with WHO or CDC or the vaccine uh, ma manufacturers, and I'm very comfortable with that. Um, and my other disclaimer is that I am, without any question, a vaccine zealot. So um, I don't have any uh, hesitation in um, sharing the fact that I've had a lot of these vaccine-preventable diseases. I had chickenpox as a kid. I had mumps. I almost died from typhoid fever one time, but that's a different story. Um, and I've seen each and every one of the vaccine-preventable diseases. I'm probably one of the few people um, in this region that has seen literally every vaccine that we've, uh, every vaccine-preventable disease, including smallpox. Um, and so I have a healthy respect for these diseases. I just got back from uh, a six-country, seven-day trip um, on Sunday um, through East Africa, working on one of my CDC projects, and literally saw measles as kids were walking down the street. Um, and uh, a number of other pretty significant diseases um, over just a, a short period of time. So these things are out there, they're still real, um, and they still continue to visit our country pretty readily as um, people get off planes. So um, the objectives are basically to talk a little bit about what the vaccine recommendations are during pregnancy, talk a, bit, a little bit about the, the safety and efficacy data, um, as well as some other vaccines that are of importance to you folks, and then talk about some of these new vaccines that are being studied. Um, and I'll try, I cut, I cut some, well, when you guys were running over with your uh, M and M. I cut some of this stuff out just to hopefully be able to stay on time. I do want to touch on kind of the obstacles that I see um, for how challenging it is to actually immunize during pregnancy, um, and then talk briefly about why then preconception vaccines are so important. Because if you do have families in, that are stressed about actually immunizing during that vulnerable period, there actually are some of these vaccines that can be utilized prior to, to conception um, that can sometimes make things a little bit easier. I'm going to focus on influenza and pertussis, obviously, as the two big ones, and then talk a little bit about the new vaccines. I cut the HPV stuff. We can do that at another date if I get invited back. Um, whoops. So just to give you a quick sense, you know, we have been remarkably successful with vaccines, and I think this is part of the problem that we all suffer with, is that if you look at See if this thing works. So if you look at sort of just the maximum amount of morbidity from some particular year in the 20th century, you know, we used to see about a half a million measles cases a year. Um, we would see about 20,000 haemophilus influenza cases a year. We saw about 200,000 pertussis cases a year. And if you look at just sort of a random year of what has been reported, you can see that our success rates have been well on the order of almost 99, 100% decrease in the, the rates of these diseases. And that's important because that's part of what people respond to when they're thinking about are they going to make an action to actually do something to protect. And one of the things we have to deal with with people that are hesitant about vaccines is that vaccinating is actually a conscious decision to do something. And so when people are afraid of things, the natural tendency is actually to do nothing. 
And so one of the things we've discovered, at least in the vaccine hesitancy space in pediatrics, is that if you show parents pictures of how terrible these diseases are, their natural inclination is to then not vaccinate because they are so afraid that then they're actually being asked to do something. And so we've actually had to change our approach in actually making these a proactive, positive uh, intent that you're doing something for your kid rather than you're doing something to protect against something else. Because fear actually is a negative driver. And it's one of those things that from a behavioral psychology standpoint, like blew a lot of our minds. We thought we were on the right track by like putting together these videos and these scary pictures and these scary websites. And it turned out people were like, yeah, that's terrible. And I'm not going to vaccinate because that's also doing something. So it's an interesting psychology that we have to deal with when we think about these things. The other is that obviously vaccines have become something that is now across the lifespan. So no longer are vaccines just for little babies and for the elderly, but these really go across the entire lifespan. And they have very specific schedules now for people with particular medical conditions, uh, including being a healthcare personnel, which is actually a medical condition, as well as being pregnant. And so this is one of the few spaces where we actually have a bunch of vaccines that are contraindicated, as well as some that are routinely uh, recommended, which is the Tdap and influenza. Obstacles for trying to make this stuff happen, um, as we've surveyed providers that do maternal, fetal, uh, and child medicine, um, is that some clinics are not immunizing clinics and don't routinely stock vaccines um, that are available, um, that there's a lot of missed opportunities. Um, if you're a, a clinic that only does prenatal care but doesn't give vaccines and are counting on primary care providers to do that, the number of visits, obviously, to somebody other than an obstetrician during pregnancy are limited, and so the opportunities to provide those vaccines, at least in some communities, are fairly limited. One of the things I have great sympathy with um, is the fact that the FDA actually really doesn't have very many vaccines that are actually approved for pregnancy. And it makes sense that pharmaceutical companies are obviously risk averse, and the odds that they're actually going to do much in the way of studies in pregnancy are pretty small. And so we are forced to sort of deal with a, an alternative universe which involves the ACIP, the American Council on Immunization Practice, being actually the group that supersedes FDA. And so I'll talk about that in a second, but it is important to recognize that most of the data that we have around vaccines puts them into a category C, which is basically that there may be some evidence of animal studies showing adverse events on the fetus, or that there's no adequate or well-controlled studies in humans, and that the potential benefits may warrant use in pregnant women despite the potential risks. But that's the category that sadly most of you are stuck with when we talk about vaccinating during pregnancy, which I can understand would lead to some trepidation. And then obviously from the, from the maternal side of things, um, the risk averse nature of people wanting to do anything they can to protect their fetus and not putting anything into their body that may adversely affect them, as well as this ongoing public perception of the lack of value of vaccines, again, because we've gotten rid of a lot of these diseases and people don't fear them the way they used to. Just a side note, just to sort of help you understand how this vaccine safety side of things works, I think people need to understand that the FDA is actually only kind of the middle part of the process of assessment for the safety of vaccines. So when we look at vaccine trials in the preclinical times, there's all of these phased clinical trials that, that people go through phase one, two, and three as they look at initially safety in the, the appropriate age group, dosing schedules, um, and then safety data is eventually then submitted to the FDA for licensure and recommendation. That is not, though, where the process st stops. And as a matter of fact, that's where the process starts. Because once a vaccine then is licensed and recommended, the ACIP is actually the superseding body because they have the opportunity to look not only at the, the work that the companies submit to the FDA. You know, if you imagine, like, sitting at the FDA, when companies submit their work, it's like they're best, shiniest version, you know, it's like the book report with the little plastic cover thing and the slidey thing on the side. There is usually so much more information and data that's available, either from other countries where these vaccines have been available for much longer, or a lot of other just published literature that FDA has no um, obligation to review or put into their, into their um, reviews. Now, more and more they have been doing that lately. But with that said, FDI, FDA basically gets sort of the first pass at this. ACIP is really the ones that get to look at the entire, the entire portfolio of available information about that disease and about those vaccines. And so there are lots of vaccines that ACIP has made different recommendations than what the FDA licensure dictates. So rotavirus vaccines have very different age indications than what they're licensed for. Tdap vaccines are recommended in a lot more groups than they've ever been tested in or licensed. 
So we now use them routinely in both younger and older individuals than what the actual FDA licensure is around. So it's one of those things that I think I want to just make sure people understand and are reassured that just because you're doing something outside the FDA licensure, it's nothing other than that's just part of a process that really actually falls mostly to the ACIP. And then after that, I think the part that should also reassure people is that all of the companies, as well as all of the public health organizations, have a very robust post-marketing uh, safety surveillance system. So that while studies submitted to the FDA may have a couple thousand or maybe tens of thousands of patients for vaccine trials, we literally have millions and millions, over 20 million people under active surveillance at any given time looking for safety signals based on these networks that have been created largely using the electronic medical record. So hopefully that helps reassure because I know some of the pushback we've gotten from some providers is that we're asking them to give vaccines in pregnant people that are not licensed to be given in pregnant people and have never actually been tested in, in formal trials in pregnant people. And so this is at least hopefully something that will reassure you about that process. All right, so then quickly, let's just talk about the preconception time um, when there are opportunities where we can think about um, vaccines that people may need uh, that we certainly either can't give in pregnancy or people may be reluctant in pregnancy. I think the most important ones are probably MMR and varicella. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about how widely used MMR vaccine is um, in most of the world. Um, I, part of the reason I was just in Africa um, working on this 12-country um, project where we're sort of helping improve systems and, and system strengthening is that they're starting to finally introduce new vaccines into many of these countries. And so pneumococcal vaccine is for now being introduced into many countries. And we're just starting to transition from measles monovalent vaccine to measles rubella vaccine in many countries. So I think people have this concept that these vaccines are used routinely and widely, and that when people will come from other countries, that if they're immunized against measles, they're protected against rubella and all those other things. And in fact, they rarely are. And so this is one of these times that I think making sure that in a preconception visit that you at least check not only what vaccines they think they've received, but also actually think about your titers to document what's actually been given is really very important. MMR and varicella obviously are live viral vaccines, and so we want to avoid those during active pregnancy and actually even avoid pregnancy for 28 days after those are administered so we uh, get through the replication cycles that those go through in the body to give maximum immunity. Now, with that said, if they are given it in inadvertently either during pregnancy or somebody gets pregnant shortly thereafter, there's still no indication that termination is something that anybody would recommend and there actually is a national registry. So if you work through your patient safety network, this is how these things get logged into the registry and we continue to accumulate now millions and millions of patients that have received these showing that they actually are relatively safe in those settings. Congenital varicella um, syndrome, although it's been rarely seen in p patients who did receive live viral um, varicella vaccine, um, has occurred on a couple of occasions. Now, varicella infection, when it occurs in the early parts of pregnancy, um, can be fairly devastating, um, where these kids will end up with all sorts of um, char characteristic lesions, but the most probably significant things is the amniotic band syndrome that we see with these uh, varicella cases. So for people that have never had varicella or are unsure of their uh, past immunization status, I think it is important for them to understand that uh, varicella is one of the most significant diseases that you can prevent. And we've lost a lot of the circulating disease in this country, obviously, because of immunizing, which is therefore then led to less boosting of people's immunity. And this is one of the reasons you're starting to see a little bit more shingles um, in some populations is because people aren't getting naturally reprimed by exposure to little kids who are walking around with varicella. So the history part is a little bit challenging for some people, and making sure that they actually know what their status is is important. Congenital rubella, obviously, every obstetrician has this hammered into their head for every board exam ever known to man. Um, but this is one of those diseases that we unfortunately still continue to see happen um, in many areas of the world. And actually, one of the things that's kind of tragic sometimes is that as the vaccine programs get started in many countries, unfortunately, the rates of congenital rubella actually go up. And one of the reasons for this is because unless you get really good penetration and get over 90% of people covered very quickly, you end up then with a cohort sometimes of people that grow up who never got vaccinated but also never got disease when they were young. 
And so what we saw in Russia, for instance, was when they introduced the measles rubella vaccine back in the 90s, they actually had a dramatic um, and almost catastrophic outbreak of congenital rubella because they were unable to get more than 60% of people vaccinated. And so an entire cohort of young women grew up who actually were vulnerable. And then when disease got reintroduced, they unfortunately had um, massive rates of disease. So just to give you a sense for kind of how widely available rubella vaccine is, this was 1996. And you could see that it was really a pretty rare vaccine to be used outside of Western Europe and North America. This is 2008, and we had at least started to penetrate into most of the Asian subcontinent, uh, sorry, the, the North Asian continent, but had really not touched the major populous regions of the world in the Indian subcontinent and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is the data then from this year, and this is where we are um, currently. And so you can see that this whole area of Sub-Saharan Africa is just starting to work towards introduction of rubella vaccine. So I just got back from Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, and these are the three newest countries where we've started to work towards introduction of the vaccine. But Ethiopia and many of these other areas here where we see uh, fairly large uh, numbers of, of immigrants here into the United States um, continue to not use these vaccines at this point. Um, and we continue to, to struggle to get Pakistan and Afghanistan um, to be able to use these as well. So just to be aware that these are only recently being introduced into a lot of these areas, and a lot of people of childbearing age grew up in countries where rubella vaccine was not routinely used. And then just as an uh, aside, because I know those of you that were, deal with infertility and families that start discussing um, the possibility of, of adoption, um, international adoption, although the rates have dropped off quite dramatically over the last eight years, um, still continues to be actually a major risk factor for people being exposed to hepatitis A. Uh, and so we've had quite a few um, cases over time of families that have gone to pick up kids um, that were not um, uh, savvy enough to have visited a travel clinic and unfortunately developed hepatitis A either during travel or as they pick up the kid and bring them back because hepatitis A is really um, endemic in, in most areas of the world. Um, and then obviously there's lots of other vaccines that need to be considered um, uh, for travel um, as well as for other families, including hepatitis B vaccine for discordant couples, meningococcal vaccines for people that are traveling, pneumococcal vaccine um, because un unimmunized women um, it, that are in a high risk group um, that have other underlying problems, asthma, smokers, et cetera. All right, so then let's move into talking about the actual period of time when mom is actually pregnant. And again, we're going to focus primarily on influenza and pertussis. So the idea overall for these is basically to try to protect the newborn, obviously, by giving mom enough maternal antibody that she can transfer transplacentally. The secondary aim for some of these is then to also offer protection for mom herself. Um, very different organisms uh, that I think are important to recognize. You know, influenza viruses obviously cause a typical flu-like so symptoms. Bordetella is a bacterial infection that causes these fits of coughing, um, often known as the 100-day cough. The, the bottom line, though, is that they all come together um, in one nexus, which is hospitalizations, pneumonia, and death, whether for the mother or for babies. Our issues with the infants, at least, is that pertussis vaccine, we only start immunizing in the United States at age two months, and so the infants are the groups that are actually at the highest risk. Um, influenza, we actually only can immunize kids starting at six months and above, and so they're really quite vulnerable, both because of their surroundings, but also because they don't have a particularly good immune system. Um, and so these kids then get vaccinated themselves, but there's still this window of time where they're particularly vulnerable. Um, these are both diseases that obviously continue to circulate and reemerge here in the United States. So influenza vaccine is routinely recommended now for women who are pregnant or may become pregnant during flu season. Um, and can be given at any trimester. Tdap vaccine is routinely recommended during every pregnancy because unfortunately the immunity of these acellular vaccines is not particularly robust. So when we moved away from the whole cell vaccines to the acellular vaccines to try to diminish a lot of the side effects from the vaccines, we unfortunately lost some of the immunogenicity. And this has been really one of the major reasons that we've had a reemergence of pertussis in the United States is that we've gone to sort of suboptimal vaccines to try to at least acquiesce to the concerns people have about vaccine safety and vaccine side effects. And so the problem with this not particularly robust vaccine is that it needs to be given late in the pregnancy to give enough immunity that it actually makes much of a difference for the infant. All right, so let's start out with influenza. This, I assume, is what it sounds like most of the time when I open my mouth in public forums. All right, so why do we immunize it in, uh, for influenza during pregnancy? So 
we know that there's an increased risk of influenza-associated morbidity during pregnancy. Um, we have evidence, which I'll share with you, that there's adverse neonatal outcomes that are associated with mothers who actually have influenza during the pregnancy. We have evidence that vaccination protects the babies, and we have evidence that babies born during influ influenza season to vaccinated women are less likely to be premature, are less likely to have small for gestational age deliveries and, and low birth weight. Um, we also know that people who do not receive flu vaccine during pregnancy um, can still benefit from getting it postpartum uh, uh, prior to discharge from hospitals. And so at least at the UW, we, try to, we have a screening program for everybody admitted uh, and offer both pneumococcal and influenza vaccine. And more and more hospitals are starting to adopt this um, as routine practice. So what are the benefits of maternal influenza vaccination? Well, this is a small study that basically, in a prospective way, tried to randomize um, mothers to look at what would be the benefit um, to the infant of these mothers being immunized, as well as what is the benefit to the mother. And so in this study, they showed that basically there was a 63% vaccine effectiveness for protection of the infants, um, as well as about a, a decrease of a third of respiratory illnesses in mothers um, with fever. These are not necessarily just influenza-related diseases, but this is just based on a log diary system where women um, logged whatever their symptoms were throughout their pregnancy. We know that the duration of immunity is actually better than we had assumed, and so the duration of immunity with those transplacental antibodies does seem to last out for at least a good six to eight months, gapping then into the period of time when babies are first eligible for vaccine. So this seems to be relatively effective. Um, a couple of different ways of then also looking at some of the uh, some other data, and, and I'll have to confess that you know since people aren't crazy about doing research in pregnant women, there is actually a paucity of data. So I kind of did a deep dive, and you're basically going to see for most of the things I'm going to talk about, most of what's in the in the medical literature. So this is an area that actually is wide open for for further study. Um, this was a study um, that was a result of the 2009 H1N1 um, influenza A outbreak where the UK, with their nationalized healthcare system, was able to look at all their maternity hospitals. They were able to look at pregnant women who were admitted with confirmed H1N1 compared to uh, another cohort of non-admitted, non-ill um, patients. And what they saw was, as expected, uh, much higher perinatal mortality rates in infants um, that were born uh, in infected women, um, drastically increased rates of stillbirth, and increased rates of premature delivery um, in, um, in those uh, cases. Um, uh, another study that came out of New York City during the same outbreak um, was, I think, uh, a little bit more helpful um, because it gives us a little bit more data on kind of what we can tell families and patients. So when they looked at pregnant women who had contracted H1N1 during that 2009 outbreak, they basically saw that there was about a seven times greater likelihood um, of being hospitalized than there were for non-pregnant um, patients, and there was about a four times greater risk of being admitted to an ICU rather than um, somebody who is not pregnant. And there's a lot of theories that have bounced around. I think we used to be taught in medical school, at least when the, some of us were a little bit older um, were in medical school, um, was that uh, pregnancy was an immunodeficiency um, condition. I think we've clearly learned that that's not true. I think it's an immunologic chaos, um, but some of it's immune deficiency and some of it's actually hyperimmunity. And so much of the morbidity and mortality thought to be related to these infectious diseases during pregnancy is actually because of the hyperimmune response that is sometimes mounted by these um, pregnant women. Um, the other is no, we know, obviously, since there's a mass effect from having a large parasite in your belly, um, is that you have increased ventilatory demands and decreased functional residual capacity, um, which therefore then changes the whole dynamic of both um, fluid as well as respiratory status. Um, a couple more recent studies that have come out just in the last couple of years have basically looked at both H1N1 and non-H1N1 um, strains of influenza. And if I sort of tally these up and kind of do a back-of-the-envelope meta-analysis, you see somewhere between a 50 and 90 percent overall reduction in influenza in infants born to mothers that were immunized. Um, actually, the highest efficacy seems to be against influenza A, um, H1N1, um, with H3N2 being a little bit less uh, robust. Uh, immunogenicity. And these were all studies where the inclusion criteria was that the, the mother had been immunized at least two weeks 
prior to delivery, which basically gave them enough opportunity to actually develop a decent immune response. Again, some variability for strains, but if you're looking for numbers to share with patients when you're trying to convince them to get flu vaccine, you know, I think you can basically tell them uh, probably a two-thirds of absolute protection in a black and white world, and probably enough data to support that even if they got influenza, it's a much milder um, case. And part of the reason I think all of that is important is because of this data that comes out of Scandinavia. So in countries that have these large national healthcare systems with large national databases, they can do a lot of work that we really struggle to try to do in a, a disjointed system like we have here in the United States. And so there's, and, and I always point out that it's Scandinavian because you have to understand why there's all these weird letters um, in everybody's names. Um, but what they've been able to do throughout Denmark, Norway, a number of other countries, Finland, um, is with their large databases actually start to look at the role of maternal infection and outcomes for fetus. Um, and what they've seen is more and more that any kind of maternal infection, especially a febrile illness during pregnancy that results in a hospitalization, um, leads to markedly increased rates of neurodevelopmental delay in those infants. Um, and this has been seen over and over again. Um, with this paper that came out in pediatrics recently, um, being really very compelling. Again, this is very preliminary in some ways because it is really hard to, to get these data to correlate um, between mothers and babies. But I think there's more and more information. We certainly know from animal studies, you know, if you look at Zika and any number of other um, types of infections that can occur um, in the mothers, um, that there is a significant maternal immune activation that happens during any kind of febrile illness during a pregnancy. And those do cause fairly significant deficiencies in fetal neurodevelopment. Um, and so one of the larger studies was this study that came out in pediatrics um, recently um, that looked at Denmark and, and followed 100,000 children. What they found was that mild infections, kind of re typical respiratory diseases that did not uh, result in fever, which is most respiratory colds and, and things like that in adults, don't have any association with neurodevelopmental um, issues. But as soon as you get a prolonged fever during uh, pregnancy of any sort, that leads to a three times increased risk of neurodevelopmental delay in those infants. And maternal influenza, when it was documented, basically doubles your risk of ending up with an autistic child. So if you're looking for compelling arguments with a mother who's concerned about safety, I think that's a pretty, pretty compelling argument to do everything they can to avoid febrile illnesses with the most significant and predictable one that happens every year being influenza. Um, and more and more now, again, people are starting to look at this. This is a, a study that just came out um, at the end of 2019, um, again, from Scandinavia, from Sweden, where they looked at almost 2 million kids um, and they've actually been following kids for 41 years um, using maternal recall, but also old medical records. So they have nationalized healthcare system with records 
people tend to try to avoid live viral vaccine. Thank you, Corey. Um, and then just give, give you some quick um, data on kind of how things look here in Wisconsin when we look at how our rates of immunization are for pregnant women. Um, you can see that basically a pretty wide range. Dane County, thanks to all, all of you folks, leads the pack where about two-thirds of pregnant women um, have appropriately been immunized. And you can see, obviously, that since this is a seasonal disease, um, that the vaccine is not offered very readily during the summer months, but that somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of, of women are being given the opportunity to be protected against influenza. So we clearly can do better, and I think as you communicate with your colleagues um, around the state, I think it's important for people to, to really sort of get on the bandwagon and understand um, the importance of this. And if nothing else, I mean, the problem that we, are, we always deal with with influenza, it is just such an unpredictable disease. It mutates constantly. We never know which strains are going to show up. I mean, who would have predicted that this was going to be almost exclusively a B uh, vaccine, uh, strain season, um, which we hadn't seen you know, much of uh, as far as this kind of pattern in about 20 years. Um, and now we're going to end up with a double whammy because now the A is finally showing up, and so we're going to have sort of a second peak of influenza. So the other part of this is it's never too late to actually vaccinate, and this is a perfectly reasonable time to continue to offer vaccine, even for people that have not yet um, received vaccine. All right, deep breath. So I was happy that I actually got at least an hour in my day that I don't have to talk about coronavirus, because basically since I got off the plane um, from Uganda, all I've been thinking about is um, this beer virus that's been going around. And it is really pretty remarkable to me that both the media and the public, it's all about like what's the latest shiny sparkly object that shows up. You know, we've had essentially 500 and something people die from coronavirus worldwide. We, we've reached almost 9,000 Americans have already died from influenza, which is going to be one of the worst seasons we've had in over 20 years. Many of them healthy. You know, of the 50 kids that have died, almost all of them are completely normal healthy kids that were just unimmunized. So, you know, when we look at sort of a context and a comparison, I mean, influenza is literally killing Americans left and right, and yet everybody's all focused on this coronavirus thing. Now, maybe some of these infection control concerns and everybody actually getting religion about Purell and all those things and maybe restricting travel might help get this uh, flu season under control a little bit. But no matter how you slice it, I mean, flu is a much better and much more important thing to talk about than coronavirus. So when people do bring up coronavirus and their fears, I think it's a great opportunity to, to launch into a discussion of influenza and making sure people understand really what's important. All right, I'm going to switch gears and talk about pertussis. So pertussis, as I mentioned, you know, we've been a little bit of a victim of our own success um, in that we had controlled the disease with the whole cell vaccines for many years and with the concerns about febrile seizures and others related to the whole cell uh, vaccine, we transformed into an acellular vaccine that unfortunately is a lot less immunogenic. We know by itself that the disease itself isn't even that immunogenic. And so the immunity, even if you've had wild-type pertussis disease itself, wanes fairly quickly in some people, can linger a little bit longer in others. Um, but the vaccines really don't last particularly long. And unfortunately, each dose of Tdap vaccine that is given is less immunogenic than the one before. And so this is one of the reasons that we've gone to this really, I think, very unusual, and it was very kind of a a brave and bold thing that the ACIP did without a whole lot of data on multiple dose ad, uh, administration or in pregnant women, that they recognized the importance of this disease, that they made the recommendation that um, pregnant women should receive the vaccine with each and every pregnancy. And this has basically been the evolution of our attempts at trying to control Tdap, so uh, uh, pertussis. So back in 2006, um, we had the idea of let's give this before or after a pregnancy, this cocooning idea of immunizing everybody that the patients, that the babies were going to be around. That didn't work. Um, and so then the idea came up in 2011, let's give it during the pregnancy if never previously received. And the idea was we'll give it after 20 weeks of gestation. More data emerged then that showed that that was some of them a little bit too early. And so we've moved into this later trimester uh, to try to get maximum immunity. So the 2013 recommendation was basically then to give it every pregnancy, 27 to 36 weeks. Primary protection here is really for the infant. Unlike influenza, where there's very substantial benefit to the mom herself, there isn't as much data that pertussis um, is a major impact, at least for the mother's health, um, if she contracts pertussis during the pregnancy, other than just the misery and inconvenience of coughing constantly. Um, very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, um, ACIP actually came out with new recommendations that basically, I think, have started to sort of uh, 
the death knoll is on the horizon for the TD vaccine, the old tetanus shot when you step on a nail, and basically saying that Tdap can be used uh, as a replacement for TD in any situation. And so I think that finally we're going to see a movement away from the TD vaccine. You know, this has got te tetanus in diphtheria. You know, for many years it was just TT, and then people decided, eh, it may be worthwhile to slide in a little diphtheria booster periodically to try to get that disease to go away. We're finally reaching that same point after 20 years of this where let's just slip in a little pertussis immunity for everybody when they get their tetanus shot as a way of seeing if we can get a little bit better control on this disease as it continues to circulate. Again, partially because it's just not a great vaccine. And so we just kind of keep this low level immunity in the communities. Maybe we can finally start to get rid of the carrier state that allows this to continue to, to reemerge. So basically, Tdap is going to be used for those routine every 10 year boosters that people get um, for prophylaxis for wound management and is going to replace uh, the vaccines um, when kids are under immunized if they're over seven years of age. Now, we live with pertussis. Um, pretty regularly in Wisconsin. Obviously, we used to be in the epidemic um, that everybody else had, but we had two pretty impressive outbreaks here in Wisconsin in 2005 and 2011. Um, safety stuff is, is, I think, really quite reassuring. Um, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System constantly is monitoring for side effects from vaccines. Um, with every pregnancy where somebody um, was uh, receiving doses, they were being monitored, and now they actually have lots of data on repeat um, dosing. Um, interestingly, UK, as a nationalized healthcare system, has actually been doing this for much longer, and they actually have a lot more data. They have one woman who's actually received eight doses of Tdap over a 10-year period um, and had absolutely no increased risk of side effects, either pain, swelling, or fever from multiple doses. So I think we're all pretty comfortable that repetitive dosing of vaccine, even though never studied, not in the FDA licensure, um, is not a problem for recipients. Um, the only thing you'll ever hear, I think, that I can find from any of the people that are pushing back about vaccines related to pregnancy is a vaccine safety data link study that showed this non-statistically significant but slightly increased um, rates of chorioamnionitis in vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. Now, obviously, there's no biological plausibility why these things would fit together, nor is that anything statistically significant. But as I've gone through like all the websites and all the blogs of all the anti-vaccine people looking at whatever I can find that they harp on, this is the only one that I could find that they've actually got any data that supports their um, opposition to vaccine. Oh, and I should mention also that in that same vaccine safety data link study, they actually showed a pretty dramatically decreased rate of preterm labor, which I think actually makes sense, because if you're coughing constantly, you know, I think that your uterus eventually is going to start thinking that something's going on and it might want to do something. I anthropomorphize everything, including bacteria and viruses. So. Um, and then we've got more and more data also then showing exactly how good the protection is for infants. So this is a paper that came out in pediatrics a couple of years ago using the Kaiser Permanente um, massive system where they looked at full-term um, newborns, and they were basically able to show 90-plus percent effectiveness for the first couple months after birth during a pertussis outbreak that was occurring um, in, in California. Um, and so over the first year, um, they were able to show about a two-thirds better protection in addition to what protection you get from the routine T, uh, DTaP vaccines. So I think there's clearly benefit um, to the infants. The uh, antibody studies then that have been actually measuring serologic data um, in the infants who have received the vaccine have basically showed that the antibodies persist for about four to six months. There is a slight blunting of the response to the very first DTaP vaccine that's given to the infant at two months of age, but it doesn't seem to be clinically consequential because they've actually still got this residual maternal antibody sort of picking up the slack. So that was one of the only concerns when they started down this path, is would there be anything immunologically that would change the baby's response to vaccine? And the answer is not anything significant enough that it would be a problem. Um, I'll, I'll buzz through this, but you know, one of the things we were curious about when these new recommendations came out um, and we studied um, here in Wisconsin is how quickly then do maternal um, caregivers actually adopt these kinds of recommendations? And so we studied all of you folks um, whether you realized it or not. And basically our questions were how quickly did pregnant women actually start getting Tdap and influenza vaccines? Um, who were they that were getting them? And more importantly, who are the risk groups of patients that we actually um, miss? And I think 
some of this is important stuff to think about. So we basically used health insurance claims data um, and looked at deliveries and the vaccinations they received in the 40 weeks prior to delivery. And this is the state data that I share with you on influenza and I'll share with you on pertussis. This is basically the model then that we've used to continue to collect um, that data. So this is in the first um, sort of 18 months after introduction of these new um, programs, um, how quickly they were adopted statewide here in Wisconsin. And I think for most of us, I think we were actually really quite reassured that the word gets out quickly and that you guys actually really are, at least for the majority of people that take care of, of women during pregnancy, are early adopters of new recommendations when the recommendations make sense. Um, so that Oops. So that within, you know, sort of 15 months, um, we saw that about 55% of women um, were actually getting Tdap vaccine during pregnancy. So while it wasn't nearly as close to what we would have wanted it to be at 90% or above, um, it at least showed that there was relatively early adoption. Um, similarly, influenza vaccine bumped up a little bit so that the baseline rate of influenza vaccine being given in pregnancy prior to the Tdap recommendation was about 40% and actually bumped up to about 50%. And this is one of the things we see with other vaccines as well, is that a new vaccine recommendation does kind of drag along other vaccine behavior. And so we're hoping that this trend um, will continue. The other thing that was kind of interesting is that in the beginning, people were sort of giving vaccine kind of willy-nilly um, at whatever time. But within this 15-month period, that it went from 60% of people had received it at the appropriate time to about 90%. So the early adopters that were doing it figured out pretty quickly how to do it and do it appropriately. Now, who are the people that didn't get vaccinated? And we continue to see these being the major gap groups um, that I think still need a, a light shined on them. So the young mothers, I think, are the ones that obviously um, are uh, certainly less likely to, to seek medical care. Um, or seek routine medical care. Um, Medicaid recipients, people living in Milwaukee County, and then people who ultimately are delivered by midwives or nurse practitioners. So those tend to be, still to this day, the groups that tend to be the lower immunizing rate, um, populations. So for those of you, especially students, that do spend time working with other uh, providers um, that work at some of these birth and delivery sites, you can help kind of share the word and kind of help people understand the importance of these of these. Now, with that said, there's also a lot of patients that specifically seek out these kinds of providers as opposed to routine um, MDDO kind of um, care where they, where they know they can get alternative, whether it's water births or home deliveries and things like that, um, that some of us consider a little bit more risky, um, that there is a self-fulfilling prophecy in these people being the people that also avoid vitamin K and all the other things that we deal with. So how are we doing with um, Tdap vaccine. So Tdap actually, interestingly, we do better than we do for influenza overall. Um, uh, for a change, uh, Dane County actually does not lead for Tdap vaccine recipient. Um, Green County actually happens to be the highest at 90% um, immunization rates. But you can see that, you know, in, at least in the central kind of most populous part of the state, that more than 80% of women are actually getting Tdap vaccine in most of these areas. So I think we're, we're fairly effective at, at these. Um, uh, I think there are some, some disparities still. Medicaid continues to be an issue. Obviously, people that get inadequate prenatal care, and then certain ethnic minorities continue to be in those kind of neglected um, uh, groups, obviously largely um, that some of these are in that Milwaukee area where we uh, continue to see the lowest rates. So we're doing well, we're not doing great, uh, and we can certainly do better. Uh, and there's more and more um, publicity around these kinds of things. So CDC and a number of other organizations have really been sort of taking out ads and pushing this material live um, to, the, to the general public as well. And so hopefully this will continue to sort of move the needle um, on these things. And then just to finish up, I wanted to share with you at least some of the things that people kind of ask about frequently for what's the status of new developments um, into this uh, idea of immunizing during pregnancy. One of the hot ones has always been Group B strep. Uh, you know, while we do a really very nice job of screening in most situations, that screening is really only effective um, at preventing early uh, group B strep. And so we still see late onset group B strep, even in women that are, are screened, because reacquisition does happen, um, and the, the perinatal uh, ampicillin delivery only really protect, protects against early um, neonatal uh, group B strep. So we still continue to see kids at three, four, five weeks of age who can get group B strep. So one of the ideas has been for a long time 
could we actually take the technology that was used for pneumococcal and haemophilus and meningococcal vaccines that are all polysaccharide encapsulated organisms and take that same technology and develop vaccines against group B strep. And these continue to actually march along fairly nicely um, where they had tried just plain polysaccharide capsular vaccines. They kind of failed at being very immunogenic. So they've conjugated these to proteins, um, tetanus toxoid, meningococcal um, proteins that are actually very immunogenic. And so there's trivalent vaccines to deal with many different strains of group B strep that are actually continuing to progress. And so the most recent one now has over 500 pregnant women that are enrolled, and they're continuing to look at not only colonization rates in the mothers, but also neonatal disease as well as immunogenicity. These are very well tolerated. They're very immunogenic. And so I think there is some prospects that these actually may be something that comes along. And so part of my pitch for trying to get people to be comfortable using influenza and Tdap vaccines routinely is that if we can make the, the norm that vaccinating in pregnancy is okay, it makes it a lot easier to then to add in new vaccines later rather than sort of having to get over the barrier of people even being willing to accept vaccines at all. CMV is another big one that people have been desperate for because of the congenital CMV issues that we deal with. Um, these, unfortunately, have been if not a failure, at least extraordinarily frustrating. Um, I think part of the problem really is that we still just don't understand CMV immunity very well. We know that it's primarily a cellular immunity as opposed to a lot of other diseases that deal with humoral immunity. But there's been all sorts of different trials using either live attenuated vaccines to boost maternal immunity to prevent reactivation and transmission. There's been recombination vaccines, but they just don't seem to be very protective. Um, and so the current thing that's kind of on the pipe uh, is going to be these subunit vaccines where they're taking particular components of the virus. But to be honest, I'm not particularly optimistic. And so I think we're going to be stuck with what we've continued to deal with. Contrast that with what I think is really going to be the newest and hottest thing, which is going to be the RSV vaccines. So the RSV vaccines, I think, are a reality and they are coming sooner than anybody realized. I think most people are aware of Synergist being kind of the, the, the current best available product um, that we've got. Synergist is going to go away um, as well pretty soon. Um, the company that actually owns Synergist just dumped it and sold it to some junk bond company in Sweden because they already realized that it's a dead product. So there's a new product, a monoclonal, that's going to come out um, relatively soon that's going to be just a single dose given at birth. And it's probably, if the company gets what it wants, is probably going to be vitamin K, hepatitis B, and an RSV um, long-acting immune globulin that'll basically carry kids through their first six to eight months at least. The goal is actually potentially going to be to give it to all newborns so that you don't even have to get into this risk stratification and trying to figure out, like, are you small enough and do you have enough prematurity and all that kind of stuff, that if they price it right, that may actually change the paradigm entirely. That's one model, but there are a bunch of others that are coming from a number of different companies. This was actually really interesting because this is a similar story in some ways to how HPV happened where NIH basically funded a bunch of academic institutions to develop a model for the virus-like particles to develop an HPV vaccine, and then license them back to the companies to figure out how to make a vaccine. NIH funded these studies that Barney Graham and his groups developed and figured out exactly which are the epitopes of RSV that are the immunogenic components, and then have licensed that protein uh, technology back to all these companies. So literally, almost every pharmaceutical company has some variation of an, of an RSV vaccine that they're working on. There's some that are going to be for the elderly, because elderly have problems with RSV the same way they have problems with flu. So those are going to be adjuvanted vaccine. But there's a bunch of different companies that have non-adjuvanted RSV F protein vaccines that would be given for pregnancy. Um, now, this would potentially be either a competitor for this monoclonal antibody or something that would supplement it. But the idea is that basically by using um, these vaccines, you get good neutralizing antibody. And then the supplement is going to be a vaccine for the babies themselves to then carry them then through the first couple of years of life to try to see if we can get rid of RSV entirely. So this is the stuff that's in the pipeline that I think is really important. Um, last couple things, you know, when you're talking to families about vaccination, when we look at who decides to vaccinate themselves or their babies, it's always about trusting the healthcare provider and having a real conversation about why you think it's important. People really do still respond to that stuff. They also respond to thinking that doing it is the norm. And if it's not considered something that's sort of experimental or new or a decision that needs to be made, but rather that it's just part of the norm, 
that actually makes people kind of tip towards the balance. So anything you can do in your practices with all of your providers, with all of your office staff to sort of make vaccination part of just kind of normal behavior and normal activity in the clinics really lends a lot to an atmosphere that this is just what people do. Vaccination is one of the most important things we do to keep parents and their kids safe. Vaccines are incredibly safe. They are scrutinized at a level far above other pharmaceutical products. And the, the risk of these diseases really is much, much greater than anything related to the vaccines uh, and the safety of the vaccines. And people need to recognize that not vaccinating is a decision to remain vulnerable, either individually or for their kid. Um, with that said, especially in Dane County, where we've got a lot of tree-hugging, granola-eating, Birkenstock-wearing, patchouli-wearers um, who are reluctant to vaccinate, um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to care for them and encourage good practice, continually readdressing every time these uh, opportunities come up, um, promoting all the other good practices, uh, and providing re reliable information for them to do their own research. We know that m mothers that immunize themselves are much better at immunizing their infants, and so I do look at you as sort of the front line of continuing to battle this pediatric vaccine hesitancy issue that we deal with. If you normalize vaccines for pregnancy, you normalize vaccines for children in many ways, and so you actually in many ways from my standpoint are the front line providers in really getting reliable information. And so there's three websites I think that are useful to, to think about. So shotbyshot.org is a group that has actually put together videos and testimonials by families who have suffered through these diseases to share with kind of others that want to know about these things. These are, you know, you can put in any term you want. So these are some stories about people who became ill during pregnancy from influenza and sort of sharing what that experience was like. The Immunization Action Coalition is a nonprofit out of Minnesota. For those of us that are vaccine advocates that develop educational materials, we post it all here and it's all freely available. VIS forms available in pretty much every language you've ever heard of are available here. So for those of you that deal with non-English speaking patients, all that information is all stashed here at the Immunization Action Coalition. And they got a great website name, it's just immunize.org. Um, and then the CDC has actually done a very nice job of starting to develop more and more materials that are readily available um, for both providers and for families. And I think that these can be three sites that you can refer people to if they want to do a little bit of their own research. So with that, I'll finish up. I'm happy to take a few questions. Thank you, Laura. Absolutely. There's no question. Oh, yeah. We have time for one question. And he's saying, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that part of the old cocooning stuff was the idea was let's just give everybody. And the good news about how they shifted. Um, to recommending Tdap for every pregnancy is they actually never retracted the prior recommendation that all of their surrounding individuals should also be immunized. And that was part of this new recommendation that just came out from ACIP to basically start dumping TD and giving everybody Tdap. The idea is really, let's see what we can do to get rid of other carriers. So, you know, certainly teenagers, siblings, babysitters, and all those should have received Tdap because it's required for middle school. But it is really a great idea to try to encourage grandparents and and other providers, um, caregivers in the family to also make sure that they've gotten Tdap. No, so they've dumped that. So there used to be like, oh, you need to wait you know, a year after you got your TD so you don't have to deal with increased reactions. And all these new guidelines have basically said, even if they got a TD you know, two days ago, it's okay to just go ahead and give them a Tdap. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laurel. Good to see you. What's that?